You've probably seen headlines about H5N1 or bird flu on and off over the past few years. But could it infect humans? And could we one day pass bird flu from one person to another? And could it possibly be the next pandemic? I'm Chan Yi Wim and this is Dr. Ui Eng Eong. He's an infectious diseases specialist and today we're answering your questions about bird flu. Dr. Ui, do I need to care about bird flu? I think the short answer is yes. I think everyone should care about bird flu. The reason is because influenza has caused big pandemics in the past. Influenza virus uh, lives in aquatic birds, so these birds can carry the virus for a very long time. Uh, occasionally, where they perhaps land or mix with farm animals, then what has happened in the past is that the virus has crossed over from the aquatic birds to poultry and because the virus has not been adapted to poultry then they die in masses. What are the chances of human to human transmission one day? It is definitely possible. Um, so far the human cases have mostly gotten it from poultry because that's where the contact is right because the poultry farms are big. Human to human infection hasn't occurred in, in like at, at levels that would be of uh, any alarm at all. Years ago, there was this experiment done where the researchers asked how many mutations uh, does H5N1 need to adapt to transmission from ferret to ferret, and the answer is not that many. Oh. Right. So th this this thing that hasn't happened uh, is entirely possible, um, and it may just be a few mutations away, and that's why we we need to take H5N1 seriously. But there's no way to know when or how it will happen? Unfortunately not. Theoretically, you can use a gain-of-function study to ask what mutations can allow the H5N1 to spread efficiently from human to human. But that is ethically unacceptable, right? Because you're creating something that is of danger, that puts human lives at danger when it actually doesn't exist just yet, right? So unfortunately, the answer to your question is we don't know. But this is a space that everyone's watching closely. Can I get bird flu from eating food like milk, chicken mm. or eggs? Mm. Uh, in Singapore, no. Uh, th theoretically, the, it, it is possible, but the uh, Singapore Food Agency has a very tight control over what gets imported into Singapore. And so for things like eggs and, and even uh, you know, fresh uh, uh, produce and all that. Uh, they send um, uh, SFA staff from Singapore out to these farms where they import food from to ensure that uh, good food security practices are always in place. Now, if, when you travel out of Singapore, then do be aware that you know the the type the, the the kind of checks on where the food comes from and all that uh, may not be as good as in Singapore. And so, in general, just avoid raw food uh, when outside of Singapore because. Uh, the virus is easily killed with heat, so if it's cooked, it, it's safe. Can we get bird flu from birds at the hawker centre? I think the, the, the short answer is no. The, the risk is very minimal. <clears throat> the reason is because the, the viruses are mostly in the migratory aquatic birds, right? So not so much in in the birds that we, we see around like sparrows and pigeons and all that. What are the symptoms of bird flu in humans? I think the, the uh, symptoms will be quite similar with uh, COVID-19. So obviously, I think the first one would be fever. Mm. Uh, I think that, that would be quite prominent and sometimes very high fever. I mean, with influenza virus, um, very often the, the patient can even tell you what time the fever started because it is a very sudden onset. And then of course, the respiratory symptoms like uh, especially cough uh, will be very prominent. Mm. Uh, and then and that's in, when it's in the upper airway. When it goes down to lower airway, then you can get um, uh, difficulty in breathing or shortness of breath. Does it differ between uh, adults and children or maybe older adults like the elderly? The elderly, at least for influenza, can the, the disease can be very non-specific in the sense that you know the only sign that they are re unwell is maybe uh, their more tired than usual mm -hmm. and if you measure their heart rate it's a little bit high but that's that may be that's it that's all they have until they get the severe form of disease and then they they, they go down very quickly and children uh, children will get the fever and the cough the and of course yeah the runny nose and all that yes is there any treatment available for bird flu? Mm. There, there are drugs uh, um, uh, to treat uh, influenza, Tamiflu being the, probably the more famous one. 
for H5N1, we, there's no vaccine that's been licensed yet, although I think the, the companies have produced these vaccines um, in the past and done some at least early phase trials on it. So they should be able to scale it up quite quickly. The problem with pre, you know, producing the vaccine en masse before the event is that every vaccine has a shelf life. Mm. Then it becomes very expensive to upkeep these things, especially when you don't know when it's going to happen and, and whether it would happen. Doctor, help us understand the difference between the H5N1 virus and the coronavirus. So, influenza virus is a virus with eight different RNAs. And the outside is decorated with two different proteins. One is the H, one is the N, right? And because and there are 18 different H types and there are 11 different N types. And so, how many influenza viruses are there? It's 18 times 11. So, that's how many different influenza viruses are there. are. Whereas in coronavirus, it's, it's basically just um, one single strand of RNA inside. There are mul multiple genes on that one single strand. So in that sense, it's more difficult for, for coronaviruses to swap genes with one another. Doctor, hmm. people are worried that this or H5N1 could be the next big pandemic coming out of COVID. Mm -hmm. uh, are we prepared? Has COVID prepared us well? We learned from uh, COVID that you know, we can make vaccines now quite quickly, especially with mRNA technology, right? Um, so it would be great to see that, at least for the region, we have the ability to make these vaccines for our part of the world, that we don't have to queue up mm -hmm. to buy vaccines from Europe, or from North America. Um, so that that's one. I think two is that uh, We've gone through COVID and, and I think the, the government has also gone through some exercise to see what went well and what did not go so well. So I think with, with those two things, we should, be, we should, at least from the public health infrastructure, have the ability to respond. And certainly, you know, we need to keep engaging the population as well so that they are aware of what they need to do when it does happen. Okay, that's all we have for now. We hope we've answered some of your questions. If you have any more, drop them in the comments below. And thanks for watching.